So my name is Joe Bonanno. Uh, I'm part of Citigroup uh, in our security services division. I head up our data, digital, and innovation team. That's a fancy way for saying blockchain, AI, cloud, and a bunch of other cool things. Scott? Thanks, Joe. Uh, I'm Scott Nathan. I head up Citi's global financial crimes detection and client insights team, which is really just a fancy way of saying we consume all of the data for the purposes of complying with global laws and producing a seamless client experience on the backside when our customers try and come in. So Joe and I are, Joe's on the business side, I'm on the compliance side, technology brings us together. Right, Jen? But we're both on the same side to revolutionize this industry and disrupt it and transform it. So if there's any of our clients in the audience, that's a good thing. If there's any of our competitors, sorry for you. Um, but in all honesty, we're sometimes not even competing with financial services anymore. We're competing with Google, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, you name it. So that's our direction. But anyway, so I'm going to talk a little bit about just City, the brand, what it is, just so that you understand where we fit in. Um, we'll talk about some of the challenges that we see our big institutional clients facing. Um, we'll talk about what we did with Snowflake and how it's at the heart of a lot of our core processes, but more importantly, data sharing with actual live clients. Um, and then Scott's going to really go into depth around some of the, the tips and tricks and techniques of using AI and ML for anti-money anti -money laundering. ML for AML. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So from cities for, for city, for those who don't know, you know, you see the accounts here are, I said, the branches in the U.S. You're used to seeing like credit cards and checking and all that fun stuff. So think of the right-hand side of the equation as the personal banking, right? Two-legged individuals, credit cards, debit cards, but also wealth management accounts, right? So investing, uh, et cetera. On the left-hand side is our institutional client group. Um, and it ranges from trading, which is really our markets business. Um, banking, investment banking is IPOs and fun things like that, mergers and acquisitions. Um, and then services is the team that I'm a part of. <clears throat> and it's really a, a part of the business that not too many people even understand. But there's some big institutions doing some of the things I'm going to talk to you about in a second. Um, and by way of size, just real quick, um, our business is $27 trillion in assets. Um, I think we have about 4 trillion trades passed through our systems on a daily basis. So lots and lots of data. I would say one of the big differentiators for Citigroup is that we are in over 100 plus countries. Um, and that gives us scale like you've never seen before. Um, on the right hand side, the business that I'm in has a couple of different products and services that we offer to financial institutions. So large hedge funds, asset managers, banks, uh, sovereign wealth funds, companies that you've never heard in the middle of the Middle East to Asia to here or there. Um, but we do a lot of the things after the trade. So once a trade is made by one of these big hedge funds, effectively, we hold all their transactions, positions, and balances. So if there's a stock split, if there's a dividend, we see all the trades as they take place and we clear them for them as well. So I see what's going on and what's trending in China all the way to what's happening in North Dakota. Um, that's one of our businesses. Some of the other businesses in the fund space are like for mutual funds and ETFs, we calculate the net asset value because it's made up of a basket of securities. We do a lot of what we call fund accounting and fund administration. It's known as a middle office function in our world. We also do a lot of lending and a lot of bond and debt issuance as well. So from my perspective, and, and Scott will probably chime in, um, the clients we have, we have about 4,000 big institutions. Um, and what they're telling us is we need data, we need it now, but at the same time, they're still automating a lot of their legacy processes like most companies. Um, everybody wants access to data, but the game has sort of changed. Um, and I'll talk to that in a second, but the reality is, is with the ability to share via the cloud, which is kind of the new way of doing things, um, things have evolved and most of the clients that we talk to are like, why can't we just share cloud to cloud? And that's the same with most vendors, right? A lot of our vendors who give us pricing data, ESG data, they're also saying, why can't we just cloud to cloud? Why would I have to build pipes and connections and waste resources? Um, everybody wants a slick user experience. So we all have our phones, most likely. I see a couple of photos going on. But like, you need to have that Uber and Netflix experience, but you need to power that with AI and ML and make it seamless and personalized. I would say, you know, obviously AI is everywhere these days um, and it's not like it hasn't been, um, but it seems like AI has a bigger umbrella. And when I say AI, I mean 
the old school predictive analytics. I mean large language models, but I also mean intelligent automation. And there's a lot going on in all those areas. Um, or you can call it data science for that matter. Um, the blockchain world is very, very real for us. So we're investing in building new bridges and highways to a world that doesn't really, most people don't really understand other than when you're on Coinbase and you're trading like Bitcoin or Ethereum. What I'm talking about is tokenizing traditional assets. So as an example, if you bought 100 shares of Apple at a price on a date, that's a table in fields in the database world. But in the blockchain or the distributed ledger technology, that's like what we call a token. And you can embed smart contracts in that token that says you get a 3% dividend on this date. And you can memorialize that on a decentralized ledger that trades 24 seven and doesn't take any time to settle, it's instant. That's the type of stuff we're doing here at City. And before you, you jump that, that slide, I think the three points, you know, within the, within the company, we're really working on the, on the data access and the data strategy on a global level. So while Joe's working in, on the business side, I'm working across horizontally across City to look at our data strategy and source data into a single data structure um, using the technologies that you know Joe and I have been talking about and some of the things that everyone here at Snowflake is talking about. And with, with the help of Snowflake, we're able to connect these massive data sets and partner with our existing technology vendors, our data providers, and we're really able to bring robust and rich data to life in ways that historically was stuck in over five or 600 product processors and bring all that together with our external data and provide real context. And we'll cover that more later. But one of the other things we're trying to do is use data, use compliance as actually something to generate positive experiences and actually reduce the friction the way, you know, moving, pivoting a bank like City into a, into a more proactive, client-friendly, high touch, I mean, low touch, high, ex high value experience. So we're using these technologies to reduce the amount of time it takes to bring a customer online, to reduce the amount of touch points that that customer has to go through. And in order to do all of this, we as well are piggybacking off of the same technologies. We're trying to standardize and simplify the, t the, the tool set and the stack that we're using. So machine learning models for the detection of anomalous behavior are also informing our, our ability to provide data back to folks like Joe so they can better interact and, and and uh, serve the client base with a new set of information that historically was trapped in a data box. So, um, but we're, we're definitely not touching the blockchain. That's all you. That's all me. All right, so we put this slide together to sort of highlight like where we come from, right? And I had hair back then when I used to get my physical statements in the mail. So the left-hand side, think of that sort of road as, you know, the old school way of getting statements. Now those converted into electronic statements if you haven't opted out for mail. Um, then we moved on to like FTPs and APIs, but honestly data sharing via the cloud is really one of the next best things, at least we think so. Um, and on the right hand side, it's really the technology, right? So mainframes are still around. Some of them are, you know, 40, 50, 60 years old, but really there's been a migration to even transition those to microservices, but you know, relational databases have, you know, come in over time. Um, you know, Hadoop and open source and all that fun stuff was, was once like the thing or the best thing ever. But to be honest with you, everything is cloud native or cloud based these days. And that's really when the two come up, come together, think about like having the cloud foundation or the architecture that Scott talked about where we're both leveraging, but then being able to share it seamlessly with our clients by just giving them access to our keys. Um, so that's kind of the intent of this slide. And the, the challenge with the banks that we, at least in, in large legacy multinational global banks is we have to still maintain that spectrum for a variety of reasons. So the, there are still situations where we have to produce paper documents, whether we like it or not. So we have to have a, the ability to flexibly scale between something as robust in real time as an API call. If we're, if we're doing a, for instance, on the due diligence side, if we're working with one of our large payments companies, instead of having them send us files or FTPS files, we can do real time API calls into that platform. But in the same framework, you know, we still have government agencies that require us to pull physical statements or pull data down um, in, in, in evidentiary form. So understanding the spectrum, but being able to reduce the tech debt on the top and move us to the front and hopefully convince the rest of the ecosystem that we can start to eliminate some of these. And at least on the business side, they get to eliminate it. On the compliance side, we're not there yet. Yeah, I think given city's nature being so global in 100 countries, we deal with lots and lots of different clients that are all in different transformation journeys of themselves as well as vendors. So our job is to build an interoperable frictionless platform that basically meets them on their path. So you want to come through my front door, my web portal, you want to get an FTP, you want an API, 
you want us to cloud share, we're building a dynamic, nimble platform that scales and we can do it wherever you are. Um, so I touched on this earlier in terms of the number of clients and some of the assets, but we technically have 60 tech teams in 60 different countries. So that's also pretty massive. It's not just, you know, centrally in a couple of pockets. Um, but again, these capabilities that we're building, and I'll show you sort of the blueprint in a second, um, you know, we start with our cloud foundation, right? So that's at the heart of it. Um, we come from a world where we had Hadoop and we had a bunch of old school operational data systems, um, but cloud is where we're at right now. Um, data and analytics, right? Mining data, whether it's self-serve on sort of the internal side. So we give access to people with, you know, some of the basic BI tools. We teach them how to like work and fish with data, how to build trust and trusted governed data sets, um, but then really surface those insights to some of our businesses internally. But then also on the client side, we have a whole web portal where people can access drag and drops, put their own like labels on it, um, schedule reports, uh, do whatever you want. We have a bunch of interactive workflow tools as well, but it's really about how do we make them more efficient. Um, intelligent automation, um, Scott kind of talked a little bit about payments before, but like if we know we make payments that are always $20,000 for this client, we can use AI to basically detect whether or not it breached like a 5% plus or minus threshold. So we do a lot of automation in the beginning of a lot of our data flows, as well as on the back end to make sure that things make sense. Um, I would say, you know, that blockchain world is real. Um, we don't know um, exactly when it's going to hit, but like fast forward five years from now, um, when my daughter wants to get shares of a wind farm that's out in Amsterdam and we can digitize that, by the way, I can fractionalize that and then she can buy $100 worth in her portfolio and feel really good about her sustainable investment. So I'm not just saying that, like we are physically building what I talked about before where you push a button and it creates tokens and places them on Ethereum and whatnot. We are issuing bonds digitally, we are fractionalizing them, um, and we're also taking traditional bonds, converting them and digitizing them as well. So there's a lot going on in that space, but you can't really do that without the power of the cloud, without having all your compute and Snowflake and a bunch of other things. So that's why it's really paramount to everything we do. This slide's also trying to illustrate that we're interconnected into all different types of countries and networks. So a lot of the translation between languages you know, between yen and the US dollar and the conversions and, you know, FX and all that fun stuff, that's all involved here as well. Um, so in terms of what we're building and why Snowflake is at the heart of it, um, I'll just start on the left-hand side real quick. Um, if you think about any logical data model, um, you know, effectively your reference data is the heartbeat, right? It's the glue to everything. So whether it's for us, a security table, um, it could be our client master table, et cetera, et cetera, that's at the foundation, right? Getting those right is paramount. And I think uh, Frank said it earlier, you can't have AI without a good data strategy or a good data model. Um, next comes our product data. So we have a lot of different products in this business, but stitching those together with those same sort of data points is key. And then for me, you know, I like to be creepy big brother just as much as Scott. So having access to phone logs, web logs, email logs, I wanna know when you're logging in, what you're doing on my site, or how often you're accessing certain things through the back end, whether it's an API or a cloud share. Um, so combining all that data is really what we're doing. The box B is really sort of what we'll call our integration layer, or 10 years ago, we called it a semantic layer. But effectively for us, this is really a Kafka-based microservices bus. So applications publish and consume, and they can decide when they want to consume, right? You might want it at four o'clock when the market closes in New York. You might want it real-time streaming or you might want it maybe the next day. So that think of that column B as a, both a translation layer as well as streaming real time. Uh, we land most of our data into AWS S3. We also use data mesh and we keep things even in the back end. We use tools like Starburst and a few others. Um, but S3 is really sort of where we land our data. But everything predominantly that most of our internal business users as well as external clients use sit, sits in Snowflake. So Snowflake, you could draw this the other way where Snowflake's really at the top. But effectively, Snowflake is the sort of curated compute engine that effectively powers most of our internal and external clients. And off of that, right, there's a set of capabilities. So you can come in and do self-serve internally or externally. And that could be drag and drop, that could be Tableau, that could be Data IQ, who's one of the partners here. We use a lot of different tools and capabilities. Um, separately, we have different like instances and sandboxes and dev environments to make sure that, you know, we can test and learn and move on pretty quickly. 
Um, we build applications off of this, right? So we have applications that our clients interface with. Um, and then we handle a bunch of other KYC and data services. So data services is basically the APIs and the cloud sharing. And the cloud sharing to us is really sort of like where, where we're heading next. Scott, I don't know if you want to add anything yeah, here. This is awesome, Joe, because this is a great way to quickly depict the power of connecting the dots and the services that we're actually um, leveraging. The, the, my side of the house has a litany of other applications that we're applying, which we can touch on in a bit. But what's important about the Snowflake constru construct is that as the business is growing and rapidly evolving and moving into basically real-time, instantaneous, instant gratification, clients want to move money, they want to settle, they want to do everything instantaneously. The, the, beauty, of, the beauty of the Snowflake implementation is that as the business is growing, they're constantly bringing new products, new services, everything is basically happening in real time. And the challenge associated with multiple silos of product processors, multiple processes and jobs that we run to ingest data into our data lake for the purposes of compliance, right? And analyzing the behavior of customers to ensure that we're identifying potentially suspicious behavior is a real challenge. But with, with the Snowflake strategy, um, we are bringing, um, we're bringing our, our machine learning algorithms to the data. Um, we don't have to copy data. We don't have to spend, we, we would spend lots of money trying to bring, every time the business does something, we'd have to hurry up and figure out how we were gonna move that data and make it work in the city's data privacy framework and bring it to the machine learning engines. With this setup, I can joke and tell me that the business is doing X on Monday, and by Friday we can actually be prototyping in the environment without having to move around and spend millions of dollars on creating additional layers and copied data. So this makes it a very powerful uh, strategy for us as the business is growing, because now we can literally live within your environment and affect real change. And nobody, you know, most of the major financial institutions struggle with trying to balance the compliance protocol with the client experience. And by embedding our machine learning algorithms into the business's data structure, we're able to move much more quickly. And I think that also gives us a competitive advantage, both as a financial institution, but it also gives our clients access to information on behaviors that historically would just sit trapped in a data box. So it's important for everyone to understand whether you're a consumer or a, a multinational corporation, how the flows and what the risks look like um, not only from a credit perspective, but also from just the, the hygiene of your business operation, the footprint, the risk associated with where you're transacting, the geopolitical events that may be affecting that. All that information is already locked inside of our, our um, financial crimes prevention tool set. Now we're bringing it forward so that folks like Joe and, and his clients can understand if something happens in Russia and we have to pivot, what does that mean? We can do, we can do a lot of what-if scenarios in ways that historically would have required a lot more time and money. And we're, we're also on the large language model bandwagon, right? To be clear, we have over 120 use cases and you know, clients ask us questions all the time or even prospects for that matter. And having the data organized, right? Both structured and unstructured is a way for us to kind of develop those pretty rapidly. Um, so we have models where, you know, somebody can ask a question if we do business in Canada, what's your SLA here? Effectively training large language models on that type of stuff is pretty easy but having it organized uh, and then being able to share it back, more importantly, right, with a client via like some cloud share or an API is even better, right? Versus the old school way where somebody would email a list of questions, somebody would have to farm it out to different parts of the business, then they got to collate it, figure it out, and then ultimately mail back probably a PDF and somebody's got to read through it on the other end. We can actually, using this platform, literally build models to scale and then effectively distribute it uh, at the same way. So for us, I think, you know, the reason why we chose Snowflake and what we feel our benefits are both like twofold, right? On the city side, uh, from an infrastructure perspective, right? For us, just to give some, some background, right? When I wanted more space in Cloudera or Hadoop, guess what? At City, it takes like nine months, a year, which is <laughs> a problem, right? Guess what? With Snowflake, I can push a button or make a phone call or, you know, same thing. But again, it gives us the ability to kind of reduce those costs and friction and even manage the compute if I had to. Uh, performance, you know, it's lightning quick, right, compared to some of the old school processing. So we feel that's a big differentiator in Snowflake in and of itself. And honestly, that's why I probably have been using Snowflake for five or six years. Um, you know, between exchanges now, I mean, it's kind of a genius concept, right? Think about it. 
Like if someone else has Snowflake and you guys do a very good job of marketing it, by the way, because most of our clients are like, are you on Snowflake? But again, it's kind of genius, right? Because if your backend is GCP or your backend is, you know, um, Azure or your backend is AWS, if you have Snowflake on top, Snowflake said, hey, guess what? We can just connect Snowflake to Snowflake. So works. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense, uh, which means we get, you know, access to it a lot seamlessly. Um, costs, um, consolidating multiple data marts, right? We, we don't have to live in a world where we have multiple databases. We feel like Snowflake and its flexibility allow us to scale. Um, and then there's tons of operational efficiencies. Again, because we're using a single version of the truth and we're landing it all in the same ecosystem and whether Scott's using it for his compliance team or I'm using it for clients on the front end, it's the same data. So if we get an inquiry or a question comes in, we're both looking at the same thing. Exactly. Right. So we don't have to worry about that. Um, on the client side, right, it's the same thing for them. Like they get integrations with us uh, whenever they want, right? So whether they want a cloud share, we're ready. You want an API, we're ready. Um, and it's real time, right? So we're streaming, like I said earlier, via like Kafka. So as things change, it could even be a field in a table. So if a client updates their address, it's instant, right? Or if you add a new client, it's instant. Or if we, we decide which applications we want to have it. Um, aggregations, right, are lightning quick. Uh, for them as well. And then they have their own self-serve, right? I, I know at my prior firm, um, I wasn't the type of person that wanted to log into any application anyway. I said, just give me a data dump or connect me, right? So whether I was using Adobe or Salesforce or this one, like I didn't care about their front ends. I wanted to do my own internal analytics. I wanted to do my own ML. I wanted to build my own dashboard. So effectively clients can build their own self-serve now that I can share data directly with them instantly uh, at real time. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of different use cases that, you know, different institutions that we work with are looking at, right? Especially in this business, there's a lot of malicious or anomalous trade patterns that look kind of scary. Um, and you want to make sure like you can build those detections uh, using some of Scott's techniques, um, measuring performance. Um, in our business, like we, we deal with a lot of mutual funds and how's this doing relative to the Morningstar or this rating or that rating. Uh, there's a lot of that. Um, and then for us, asset servicing is a big business. What does that mean? That means when a client gets a dividend and they need to choose whether they want it reinvested in cash or they or reinvested into a stock rather, um, they have to make choices or if we have to make a payment on their behalf. City, City actually has another business called TTS where if you think about big companies like the Googles of the world who have employees everywhere, guess what? They have to pay in, in this currency, in this country, and they have to pay in this currency in another country. Cities, the actual backbone that does it all. People don't really even realize that, but you, you need a business or you need a capability that does that. Uh, so asset servicing is a big one. Scott, I'm going to flip to you to yeah, thanks, Jim. drive on some of your slides. So piggybacking off of a lot of what Joe has already covered and we've been talking about here, in parallel with with this data strategy that we've been kicking off, um, we've been one of the main drivers for the relationship between you know, the triangulation between the business teams, my own financial crimes obligations, and the Snowflake capability set um, was the fact that we are we were already natively bringing together all of our data to make sure that we understood what our clients looked like holistically and what that really means to City for a variety of different reasons. Um, Snowflake, Snowflake inherently provides us with an accelerated path to success in this regard. And it's going to make um, our modernization priorities and some of the priorities that our CEO has laid out for simplifying the bank and really being truly customer focused is, you know, and we literally had a conversation where we, we presented this to our CEO at an offsite that we had um, where she got to see how the data, just bringing data together and using a data sharing capability like Snowflake can produce a meaningful outcome for both the billions of dollars that financial services companies have to spend to be compliant and the, and the tech stack that banks have to build to become more modern. Um, so the things that we've been focusing on are these four core principles. Um, so as I said, we've simplified our data as best as possible. We spent a ton of time going through um, massive amounts of table structures, between all of our partners across the ICG world, the consumer world, and we've deployed, and this is a multi-phase journey. It's not a one and done situation, but a common data asset that explores all of the, co the combinations and permutations of our data. Um, 
We've, em we've employed entity resolution tools within this framework that allow us to go out and connect. If Joe is the owner of a multinational corporation, historically, we may not see Joe as a private wealth client and know that he's the beneficial owner of XYZ Enterprises. So we can understand that now and we can do that more intelligently and append all of that insights to the relationship. And so whether you're using it for client contact, whether you're using it for cross-selling or you're using it to actually protect the financial system, it's all executable in a single resolved entity framework. Um, so we're using some really cool technology partners that are uh, Snowflake partners in this journey as well. Um, Data IQ, we mentioned them. There's Quantifind. I can mention a whole bunch of them. But modernizing and shifting to predictive analytics, machine learning is a big is a big component of what we do. We've been employing machine learning code for a long time. Um, we are inching towards experimentation in the AI space, but artificial intelligence and compliance don't mix. It's like oil and water. It has to be very carefully engineered, and we're 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 doing it in very safe and secure spaces. Um, we have very strict protocols around how we use. Um, true AI in this space, but our machine learning models are able to process the, you know, 4 trillion, probably around 2 trillion raw transactions per day um, and understand the anomalies associated with our customers and their counterparties. So it's not just, we're not obligated to only look at our customers and do the know your customer um, on a traditional banking relationship, but we're also required to understand our customer's customer and who our customers are interacting with. So we have to use graph and technologies that can scale to do that. If we didn't have these technologies, we would be probably, I don't know, we'd have to hire a million people to do this job. So the more we modernize, the more we shift to predictive machine learning skill sets, um, the less humans have to actually do rote processes and they can focus on true high, high, uh, high value investigations. Um, we are scaling now, and this is with the whole Snowflake partnership and the work we're doing with Joe, the open source architecture being able to go out onto cloud, we're cloud ready, Historically, these, this data classification level, highly sensitive, wasn't ready for cloud, but now we're ready to put it up on cloud, which is really exciting for City because it's going gonna, it's gonna to really bring it all together. Here's just a quick snapshot of the three kind of components of what we've already delivered um, over the past year, which was our first version of the Data Hub. I, I threw in here a little bit about the technologies we're using. Um, that's that single source of truth. The entity resolution tool set, which consists of um, Quantexa, which is a, uh, uh, a contextual decision intelligence platform. Uh, it, it allows us to connect directly to the data, no matter where the data is stored. Allow, it allows us to immediately connect the dots and nodes intelligently, and it does it in a user interface and a client experience framework that uh, is really great, because whether you're doing it for financial crimes investigations purposes and you want to just get involved and not have to worry about collecting data joining data, figuring out who's tied to who, it, it immediately presents it to you in a great, rich format. It also allows our business users to go in and say, to Joe's point, what, what's compliance talking about? Well, let's pull up our client and take a look at it. When they go into Quantexo or they go into our 360 UI, they can see the client, they can see the owners, they can see all the data that resides within that customer. So it truly brings it to life and it allows us to speak the same language when we're dealing with risk situations or we're just trying to improve a client experience or resolve a challenge that a client is facing. Um, and of course, the data science, with all this curated data, we can unlock and untrap this data and do things that historically we were unable to do. So again, Data IQ is our, uh, is our current emerging tool set that's providing support in this regard. It's, it's relationships with Snowflake and its interconnectivity. Our, my, my data science teams around the world love it. They love working in it. Um, and our quantifying partnership allows us to, to develop a really unique data fusion and machine learning capability that um, uh, is really, at, you know, it started in atomic physics and moved its way into uh, true uh, uh, anomaly detection. So it's really, uh, it's really grounded in the science. So everything we do at City is has to be truly grounded in science so that we can defend it with our um, with our regulators. Um, let me see. So and, I, and I'll, I'll kind of wrap it up. I don't. I want to leave. I want to leave some time for questions, but. So what does it look like today, right? So in, in, in our environment today, we're able to do three key things that we weren't able to do before and that would have required. So historically, and we have high profile investigations that we call it. So think about situations where you've got Russian, uh, Russian sanctions evasion. So once the Russian sanctions took place, um, whether you're in a finance, whether you're a, uh, whether you work for AWS or you work for um, a small tech startup or you work in the, in, the, in the microchip manufacturing business, 
you know, everybody's worlds got kind of thrown upside down because there were so many entities that were blocked from transacting. Um, we have, we're constantly trying to stay one step ahead of these patterns and changes in behavior. So once something happens like a geopolitical event, we have to use our models to go out and predict where the next evasion technique will take place. How are these bad actors going to try and circumvent the financial uh, and the economic sanctions and, 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 mitig and try and just get around it, right? So we're constantly doing these high profile cases. We have to constantly stay ahead of it. We have to report on it. We're grilled on it all the time by our regulators. Um, this tool set allows us to now, some of these cases are highly complicated because you've got hundreds of thousands of parties nested in different relationships across the world. And you'll see millions of transactions flowing between them through counterparties and shell companies. So the long story short, a true investigation would take an analyst uh, if it was a highly complex investigation, it would take upwards of two months for them to do a full, a full set of research, compile all the data. Again, this all has to be evidentiary, uh, have evidentiary value so it can be used in, in court if, if and when necessary. So it would take upwards of two months. And when deployed in the new technology stack using the same tools, the analysts were able to do it in between one to two hours. So the amount of human time saved um, allowed us to focus on some of the other risk in the portfolios that we otherwise would have potentially missed. So we're able to go in now, quickly analyze the data, look at the connections between the, the customers and our counterparties, understand how the relationships are coming together. We're able to now, using Elastic and the, the compute that we've established through this framework, um, historically you couldn't go into city systems. Like let's say you wanted to look up Scott Nathan at City. If, I wasn't a cust if I'm a customer, yeah, you might find me in the cards side, you might find me in the, I might have a, a small business checking account I might be tagged to that as a signer, and I might have a, I might be the owner of a company that, so at City that historically would require multiple, multiple types of searches, and there was no one size fits all search capability for that. Um, and you can't build a single core, we're not a community bank. So it's about bridging and fusing all that information together, and using this, using Elastic and using Snowflake, we can quickly say within our own trusted firewall, I need to know where Scott Nathan is inside City. So if you type in my name in like a Google type search, the application will tell me, okay, Scott may not be a customer at City, but he somehow is transacting with Joe and with Tom and with Karen and why, and, and does, that, does any of this make sense? So we do get a lot of situations where we're asked to do ad hoc research on the fly, whether it's to solve a risk situation or to even answer a business question. So now you can actually, we can actually search across all of our message traffic, which is petabytes of data. So it's pretty powerful stuff and it doesn't spin out. Like historically these queries would blow up a machine, right? So you couldn't do it and IT would, tech would call and yell at me. Last but not least, these dashboards, including Tableau, including some of our other partners, we're able to now provide the self-service view. We're able to produce real-time analysis against the behavior patterns. Analysts can go in and pull the data down. They don't have to go through and like, again, like I said, they don't have to know how to join the data. They can just go in and say, I want to see the transactions from this date range to this date range. I want to know who the top counterparties are in the transaction traffic. So basically the whole profile of that client is presented instantaneously and it's continuously updated. And as the relationships change, the graph changes. And what's most important for me at the end of this whole story is the graph view of a customer creates a much more exciting feature space for machine learning. Traditionally, we were just, we were just literally using old typologies and old features that we all thought were relevant in the industry. Now that we have graph and we're fusing data from the outside with all of our interesting proprietary data inside city, we can engineer features that we were unable to do before. And those are then fed into the data structure that are used to train the machine learning models. So as the cl customers change and as their behaviors change, the graph changes and we can, we can do things a lot more intelligently. So that's the, that's the summary of how we're using all this technology together to create a simpler, um, more customer friendly environment, but also um, really bring all of our data assets together. So yeah, I would just echo again, it's one ecosystem for whether it's Scott in compliance or me on the front office side, it's not two different platforms. And, right. And I think there's a bit of a Venn diagram as well that we get out of this, which I'll sort of describe. So as Scott was mentioning, like sanctions in Russia, like the same thing goes on my side. Like I'd love to be able to tell a client instantly, like you have heavy concentrated positions in Russia. These are the six trades that are most likely going to fail because of the yep. counterparty. 
Um, if you swap out these three securities, you're going to have a sustainable portfolio. So we can use the same techniques on sort of the client facing opportunities or give them insights or intelligence and actually pump that back through a data share. Right. So it doesn't have to be, you need to log in and you know, it's more about for us push versus pull. Um, and again, taking advantage of Snowflake uh, and the capabilities is definitely core to our, our target state or our strategy. So, all right, guys, thank you. Thank you.